Today, we're, in a, we're winding up a series called The Only Solution. And, and so here's where we've been. We've been talking about the only solution is Jesus Christ. Because here's the reason why. It's because God created us for a relationship with Him. And inside of every one of your hearts, inside of every one of your souls, there's a God-shaped void. And that void is there where you're, you're, you're looking for something. You're looking for something to make you complete. You're looking for something to make you whole. And we go from relationship to relationship. We go from hobby to hobby. We go from job to job. We go from one toy after the next toy. We shop till we drop, right? We buy things that we don't need to impress people we don't even like. That's what Black Friday's about most of the time. We do that because we're looking for something to satisfy this thing going on in our soul. And the bottom line is the only solution to today's world is not who we elect. It's not what the law of Congress passes. It's not what the school system can do and can't do. And I'm all for all of that. I, but I honestly believe the only hope for our teens, the only hope for our nations, the only hope for our vets that come back with the, the only hope for the suicide, the only hope is Jesus Christ. Does anybody else believe that? So I've been making that case and I've been making it hard during this series. And we talk about the fact that the only way we're going to get people connected to Jesus Christ is if you and I realize that God has given us the authority of the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom, and He's given us the responsibility and the authority to go and connect people to Jesus Christ and to tell them the good news about Jesus. But the problem is the devil's working hard to keep that, keep them from hearing and the bottom line is that, there, that there's so many things distorting our message because our message is not something that people like to hear because it's basically you have to give somebody else control of your life and nobody likes that. But the bottom line is the Holy Spirit said He would be inside of us and give us power. And we serve a risen Savior who's not in the grave and He's still alive and He's at work and He's doing a great thing. And so the kingdom is still advancing and still growing and we get to be a part of it if we choose to be. So that's where we've been. That's what we've been. Now today what I want to do is I want to wind this up and I want to give you the gospel message. So the title of the message today is the gospel. And I want to give you the message. Now here's why I want to do it twofold. One is because some of you is not even sure if you even know the gospel message. You're a Christian. You come every Sunday. You, you serve. You give. You're a part. You fill out your outline. You raise your hands in worship. But you're not even really sure you get it sometimes. In fact, I preach sometimes and we use comments and we use things and you're like, how did Jesus dying for me make a difference? Whatever. Let's just raise our hand, you know, because you're feeling something. You're with it. It's not that you don't believe. It's just that you don't even know if you understand it. So today I'm going to try to hopefully be able to communicate this in a way that you're going to be able to get it. And some of you have been raised in church and you've just never bought into this whole Jesus thing. Because you just can't figure it out. You just can't. It don't make sense to you. You just don't understand it. And today I believe for you, you're going to get it. For some of you, God's going to become more than a word today. For some of you today, something's going to happen deep inside of your soul because God's going to do that. So to set this up, let me give you the context of the gospel. Let me give you the context of life. I'll start by a story. One fall night, I was sitting with some friends of mine from different ages. Some of them were right out of high school, just graduated high school. Some of them were like 50 uh, years old and, 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 and we were going through the empty nest syndrome and all that kind of thing. And everything in between. Some were just right there in the middle, just kind of getting going in their career and getting going in their working and all those kind of things. So we're, we're sitting around, and I'm the kind of guy who does not like boring conversations. The problem is... I'm the one who decides if it's boring or not. You understand? So everybody else can be involved and liking it, but if I decide it's boring, I try to weasel in there and take over the conversation. You say, no, you're a control freak. Like I didn't know that. You know, right? I understand. So I understand. And, and, I like, and, and the way I like to do that is questions. I love strategic questions. As a matter of fact, when my wife and I first got married, uh, we, we, would, we lived in Virginia at the time, and we were three, and a half, three to three and a half hours away from our family, so we would drive. And so when we first got married, I, I, I found these questions, and I, I said, hey, honey, I'd like for us to talk through these questions. And so we're on our rides. I, I just fold up and put in the glove box, and when we go on our trips to Goldsboro, we'll just pull those out, and we'll talk about them, you know, on the way. And, uh, and, and we'll just talk about those, those questions, and, and we'll have them. She said, oh, okay. I've never seen the questions again. I don't know where they went. <laughs> she don't like them as good as I do, right? Well, the conversation with these guys got a little boring, got a little stale, and so I said, hey, let's ask a question. What, it was a fall night. What was your greatest, most memorable experience this past summer? And when you ask superlative questions, people are like, oh, no, 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 no
you know, whatever. And they, I said, no, I just tell you, you know, this, it don't have, you can change your answer later. But right now, what was the most memorable experience that you had this past summer? And uh, you know, nobody really said anything until, until one person broke the ice and looked over at her. She, young girl, she had big old crocodile tears and, and just strolling at her face. And she said, it was mine. It's one day when I was sick. She went over and grabbed her boyfriend and said, my boyfriend stayed with me all day and took care of me. <laughs> <laughs> Some in the room blushed. <laughs> Others of us gagged at what was going on. No, listen, I can tell you mine. It was one time down in the lake with a bunch of friends, and we were all we were all having fun, and it ended with me and my girlfriend singing praise to God and just holding hands worship. Now the guy said, I can tell you mine. It was whenever a group of us guys from our church went to Washington, DC with one million other men and stood on that, and, and then we sang how great thou art, and in Washington, DC on the mall, and sung how great thou art our God. And and I connected with guys on the bus that were in our church. I didn't even know those guys were in our church. They were really cool. No one fifty. Your lady said, I remember mine. He was out on the beach with some friends, and we started doing old cheerleading stunts. I about killed myself. I still can't walk from there, you know? And I noticed not a single person said, because I knew what they did. Some have been to Disney World. Some have been to uh, out in Ohio where the world's largest roller coaster was. That's got to be great. And not a single person said, mine was whenever I graduated from high school. Mine was not, nobody said it was when I got my letter for acceptance to the college of my dream, which one I got. Not a one of them said it's whenever I saw my Uncle Goofy there at Disney World. Not a one of them said it was whenever I got to the top of that roller coaster and got it and said, wow! I mean, that was not the most memorable experience. The most memorable experience for everybody in that circle was not a thing or even an event. It was a relationship. Parenthetically, if I was to take just a moment and let everybody in here come up here and give a testimony today, which we don't have time to do, but if we did, right, let's just start. Let's just start with you. Come on and give your testimony. Right? Why don't you jump it up? Right? <laughs> Most of you are like, it'd be a really short service if we all. <laughs> I understand. We're not going to do that today. But if I ask every one of you to come up here and say, what was the most memorable, most touching part of your life? What brings tears to your eyes when you think about it? I bet not one of you is going to come here and get the microphone and say, when I first got my minimum wage job. <laughs> you're not going to come here and say when I got my new car, my first car. It's not, you're not going to say when I got my diploma. The things that touch us the most deeply, you know what you tell me? You'd say things like, it was my grandmother. I used to stay with her. She raised me when my mom and dad split up and I stayed with her. You'd tell me about your granddaddy that taught you to drive. You tell me about your mama who was a single mama who took time for you and made every one of your games every time she could. You tell me about your dad after your parents split up, how he drove back and made sure he kept that relationship going. You would tell me about the day your child was born. You would tell me about the wedding that you dreamed when you married the love of your life. You see, when it gets to what touches us the most deeply in life and gets the goosebumps going and the tears flowing, it's usually not an event or a thing. It's a person. Somebody say amen. Is that true? You see, I am not a relational genius. And if my wife was here, thank goodness she's not. She's in kids' church. But today she would say, yeah, he ain't a relational genius. Amen to that, brother. Go ahead. I am not a relational genius. But I have learned some things about relationships. Number one, I've learned that the, cl the closest relationships to you, nothing determines your happiness like they do. I mean, when Melissa and I are doing good, my wife and I are doing good, and everything's great, and we don't have any trouble, I mean, you could cut the tires on my truck, and I'd be like, oh, I don't need to do tires anyway, don't worry about it. <laughs> but if Melissa and I are having trouble, you could stand up and give me $100, and I'd get mad if you didn't give me $200. Why? Because when Mama ain't happy, do y'all know? Yeah. Nothing determines your happiness like the people that come on, somebody. Y'all know it's true, right? When things are good at home, things are good. When things are bad at home, they're bad, right? Regardless of what else is going on. The second thing I know about relationships is that, is that there's nothing more important than the relationships. Whenever you die and we do your funeral, it's not going to be about all the compliments you, you had. 
But whenever you're laying on your deathbed, the things that you want better, I've never had anybody say, Pastor, Pastor, when you come to visit them on their deathbed, please just go get my diplomas and let me hold on to them. Go get my checkbook. I want to look at it one more time. Get that watch they gave me when I retired. I just want to see it one more time. That place I gave my life to and they gave me a stinking fake gold watch. Give it to me right now. <laughs> you don't say that. The things that matter the most when you're facing the most traumatic time of your life is bring my kids, bring my wife, bring my friends. I don't want to die alone. Because nothing matters more than relationships. Nothing determines your happiness more than relationships. Nothing more important in life than relationships. And I'll tell you the third thing I've learned about relationships. How you structure them and how you order them are essential. You can mess people up when you get that wrong. When a daddy puts the buddies, the hunting buddies or the fishing buddies or the work buddies over his wife and his kids, man, it can ruin the whole next generation. You know that, right? When a wife puts the kids in front of the husband, it can ruin a marriage, man. It just sends that marriage off into a tailspin in totally different ways. Whenever, whenever somebody prioritizes another person at work over their own spouse, oh man, it just messes things up. I know how you structure and order the relationships in your life. When parents prioritize their, their money over their kids and they think because I'm bringing home a check and I've got nice tennis shoes, I'm going to make, they, make sure they are life, but I'm not going to give them any time. It can mess up people's head, man. Y'all know that, right? Come on now. How you order relate. So I know they're the most important. I know nothing determines your happiness like them. And I know that how you structure them are extremely important. And Jesus said that. He already told us that. In fact, some, one time somebody said, can you give us the cliff nuts on Christianity? Can you sum up the Bible, if you will? Can you tell us how it all comes? I mean, that's a thick book, Jesus. Can you kind of give us the cliff notes? I mean, look how thick that is. Can you sum it up for us? And here's what he said, ready, it's on the top of your outline. Here's the verse. He said, this is the most important right here. He says, Jesus said, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with what? All of your heart and all, with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first, circle first, and what? Greatest. greatest. He's talking about order. He's talking about priority. This is the first and greatest suggestion that I'm going to give you. Is that what it says? It's not the great suggestion. It's what? The what? Amen. It's the commandment. And then he says, and the second is like it. Ready? Read it with me. One, two, three. Love your neighbor as yourself. A little sidebar. It has nothing to do really with the sermon, but it's a little sidebar. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you don't learn how to love yourself, you're never going to learn how to love your neighbor. And some of the reasons you don't never have a relationship that works out for you and all of your friends want to steer clear of you is because you don't feel good of yourself and you keep looking for your self-esteem in other people. And you're trying to make them make you feel good about you and you're draining them dry. You better learn to love yourself before you can actually love your neighbor. Amen. You understand? You've got to accept who you are or you're never going to have a healthy relationship because right people make right relationships. Healthy people make healthy relationships. Everybody understand? Yes. Now, that's the two commandments. Number one, love the Lord your God. That's first. That's the vertical relationship. First and foremost, greatest, highest priority, vertical relationships. Then number two, love people. That's the gospel summed up. All right, let's pray and go home. There it is, right? <laughs> I mean, that's it, really, it is. It's the gospel summed up. Love, love God with all your heart, not wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly, not, you know, every, when I get time, I'll go to church on Sunday, and if i got a few bucks, I'll throw them in a the plate, and whenever I'm in trouble, I'll pray. No, 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 that's half-hearted. That's selfish. Who wants to be friends with somebody like you if that's the way you treat God? wholeheartedly. If we treated God, if, if our spouse treated us the way we treat God, they'd have left a long time ago, wouldn't it? Not half-heartedly. Wholeheartedly. With all of your heart, all of your mind. You're engaged, all of your soul. You put all your eggs in that God basket. Then once you do that, that's first and greatest. If you ain't got that down, your marriage won't work out. I'm just telling you. It ain't going to work out with your child. It ain't, going to, it ain't going to work out. Because this is the first and the greatest. And once you get that down, 
Now we can start loving our neighbor. Who's our neighbor? Well, your spouse, your kids, your neighbor, your church family, your coworkers, the jerk at work. I mean, you can love all of them, right? Once you get that vertical relationship, your horizontal relationships work out. You ever wonder what is Christianity? What's Christianity all about anyway? If I ask you, if we were to go out here at Walmart or somewhere this afternoon or over at Riverburst and just walk around with a camera and said, hey, what's Christianity about? Well, we'd get a lot of answers, wouldn't we? Some would say, well, I can tell you what Christianity is about. Christianity is about rules. you got to keep the rules. It's about regulations. It's about making sure you're at church. It's about giving. It's about not having any sin in your life. None of that's right. If that was the case, we all need to go home. Because let me tell you what I know about you. you just like me. We a bunch of hypocrites kind of get a witness. Amen. Because we all want to be better than we really are. Anybody say amen? amen? And really, that's not hypocritical. That's just the way people define hypocrite. Hypocrite is somebody who pretends to be something they're not. The difference in them and us, we ain't trying to pretend we're perfect, right? We all know we're about half crazy. <laughs> so what is Christianity about then? Here's what Jesus said Christianity about was about in John. He said, he said, and this is the way to have eternal life. Now, how many of you like to have eternal life? How many of you would like to have eternal life? Hold your hand at good night. Now, see, what you're thinking you're raising your hand about is that means you go to heaven when you die. And that does mean that. But eternal life starts here. Here's how he defines it. Here's how you have eternal life. Would you like the keys to the kingdom? Would you like to know how to get in? Here it is. This is Jesus talking to God. To know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. You see, the whole context of Christianity is relationship. I'm going to make that point very clear today. Why did God go through the trouble of creating you? Why did He go to all the trouble of creating and doing all the things He did and letting His Son die on a cross for you today? And you're saying, that's it. See, I was up with you. Now you just got me confused. I'm going to explain it in just a second. Just hang with me. Today I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to make sure you get all this the best I know how. But I want you to understand up front the whole context of it was relationships. Jesus just wanted to make sure you had relationships. Now this is a little disruptive. Are you alright here? <laughs> I'm really glad this happened now and not at the end of the service, right? Whenever we're getting ready to make the call to salvation or whatever, okay? We're good. You're good here. You're passing out uh, cookies with Santa invitations, right? You're doing a fine job. You really are an eye-catching kind of guy right now. I commend you for that. I don't even have a clue what we're talking about right now. We're just... I don't even know where we are going. All right, so let's get going, I guess. Okay, here we go. Oh, we're at the Salmon Chapel moment. All right, so here it is. Ready? Here's the deal on Salmon Chapel moment. We, uh, we, we have Salmon Chapel moments, and Salmon Chapel moments are social media moments, and we ask you not to turn your cell phone off, not to turn your iPad off or whatever you may have or tablet off, but to, but to post, if I say something post-worthy or tweet-worthy, and you can do that, um, but make sure your, your devices are on vibrate so they're not disruptive, like somebody walking in with an elf costume or anything like that, so it wouldn't be disruptive or anything like that, and, and, and we don't want that to happen, so don't let your phone go off and disrupt. But here's something we would ask you to tweet. We all can tweet. You can go to our Facebook page and like the page, and, and, and you can see there. We'll tweet it, and then you can repost it or retweet it, or I don't know what we're doing on that. But anyway, Christianity is about, here goes a new blank, a relationship with God. It's not so much the spiritual things we do that make us feel better about ourselves. Because we do a lot of spiritual things that we think we're good, but here's the bottom line. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll never make it to heaven. People get wrapped up on once they go away saved and all about the dinosaurs and all these great questions. I don't know a lot of those questions, but I can tell you this if I understand scriptures right. You can walk an aisle all you want to walk an aisle. You can pray a prayer all you want to pray a prayer. You can check a box. You can go to vacation Bible school and cry. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, your eternity is in danger. Did you hear me? You can come to church every week and do anything you want to do. It comes down to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to make that point today. And I'm going to make it clear. For some of you, today, God's going to become more than a word. He's going to become a person that you can connect with. I'm hoping and pray. In fact, if you close your eyes just a second. Lord, for the person here who's always heard what I'm saying, but they've never heard it in their heart. Today, would you please use this message like a nail? And let your Holy Spirit be the hammer. 
to drive this into our heart. Drive it in our head. Some of the people in this room know what I'm going to say in their head, but it's never traveled the longest 18 inches in the world from their head to their heart. Would you drive it down? I can't do that. All I can do is do my best to make sure that they know. And what happens at the end of this day will have to be between you and them. We were joking about distractions and things like that, but I do know some people have things on their mind that will distract them. Maybe they had an argument on the way to church today. Maybe they got a, something in the oven at home, or maybe they are got to be somewhere. Would you right now let us just focus as much as we can for the next few minutes on this message and use it for your glory. And everybody who wants to be changed by God's Word said, Amen. Amen. So let's go. Ready? There's some things you need to understand if you want to have a relationship with God. Number one, you need to understand the love of God. You need to understand the love of God. Here's what the Bible says in John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world. Who's the world? That whosoever. Who's whosoever? That's me. That's you. That whosoever believes in Him will not have to perish. We won't have to do it out. We won't have to be separated from God. We'll not have to perish. We can have eternal life. That's through Jesus Christ. Here's what the Bible says in Romans, Romans 5, uh, chapter 8, I mean verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that good news? Now, I mean, the bottom line is you need to understand that God loves you. And here's the deal. All of you know that. Let's just say, I mean, you don't even have to be a Christian. You don't even have to believe any of the stuff I'm talking about about Jesus. You might not even know who Jesus is Lord and Savior. But let's just do a poll. Who in this room has ever heard that Jesus loves you? Raise your hand. Good night. You ever heard the song, Jesus Loves Me This Summer? You, know, you all heard it, right? So this isn't a new revelation, but let me tell you what I think that it gets messed up. And this is why a lot of you don't have a relationship with Christ. It's because you don't understand love. You see, when we, say, when we say God loves you, what you think you hear and what you do hear is that God feels a certain way about you. And let me just go on record and say, that's right. He does. He feels a certain way about you. But I need you to understand, the, in the Bible, love is different than a feeling. Now, in us, that's all we've got is just love. I mean, we don't have very many words for love. We love, you know, I love my wife, I love God, and I love hot dogs. I mean, you know, well, you don't love hot dogs like you love your wife or God, right? I mean, it's a different kind of love. But we only have one word. In the Bible, love means, to, means action. Read 1 Corinthians 13 sometime. It says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. It does. It's an action, it's a verb, it's, it's something you do. So when it says God loves you, it's not just that He feels a certain way about you, but He acts a certain way toward you. And that's where a lot of you have problems. Because you say, well, let's just get off of that one, Dale, because I don't want to stand up and yell at you or nothing, but He ain't that kind of God. He don't love me. He loved me. He wouldn't let my parents divorce when I prayed so hard that they wouldn't. He wouldn't let my uncle have abused me and molested me like he did. He wouldn't let my wife have left me if he really loved me. He wouldn't let a drunk driver kill my cousin if he loved me. He wouldn't let planes fly into a World Trade Center where thousands die if he loved us. He wouldn't let teenagers go into school and kill people if he loves us. Ever ask questions like that? Some of you like, no, and I'm scared right now. I like the bolts going to come out and get you for asking them, right? And <laughs> hey, let me tell you something about God. He's a big boy. He can handle your questions. <laughs> You're not so smart to kind of stump him. Amen. He's all right. I understand that. I understand why you think the way you think about that. That's okay. You can ask the question. Now, here's the, let me answer it for, for, you, for him. It was not God's will for your parents to divorce. It was not God's will for your wife to leave you for that other person. It was not God's will for a drunk driver to kill your cousin. It was not God's will for someone to be molested. It was not God's will for planes to fly in a building and kill a lot of innocent people. That happened because we have a freedom of choice. And just like when you were a teenager and you told your parents you hate them and it broke their heart. You made a dumb choice and it hurt innocent people. Just like whenever you've made other choices that have hurt people, your uncle who molested somebody made a dumb choice. 
That drunk driver made a dumb choice. Those terrorists made a dumb choice and it broke the heart of God. You say, all right, that's pretty good. Everybody's going to swallow that pill, Dale. That was good. But it's a little bit intellectually, you just took a real sidestep and got the pressure off and moved on. We'll move on, I'll let you buy with it, but then you know you really didn't answer it. Because where did they get the freedom of choice? Now that person who's thinking that way is a thinker. You're right. Where did they get the freedom of choice? And I can tell you, that was one of God's ideas that would not have been my idea. I used to train horses and train dogs, and one thing I don't tolerate is insubordination. If a dog bites me, I will stomp a mud hole in his rear end. You say, don't you love animals? I sure do. I eat them every day. You understand? <laughs> Fight my way to the top of the food chain to be a vegetarian. I will stomp him. You understand? <laughs> Horse ever kicks me, he will look in a home, baby. You understand? We're going to get out of that. I will not tolerate insubordination. Pray for my kids. I don't think they're going to make it. I really don't. <laughs> I don't think they're going to make it. If I'd have been God and I created mankind from dust, from dust raised them up and made them in my likeness and image and from nothing made something, I would not have given them the right to turn and curse me to my face. If I made them, they'd do about what I told them to do. Some of somebody, y'all know what I'm saying, right? Somebody's like, thank God he ain't God, right? You know, I don't blame you, you're right. I wouldn't have given him a right to turn and curse me in my face, but he did. As a matter of fact, I bet if God would have went to the whole heavenly host and all of the angels and put them all together and said, hey, 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 everybody come around. I'm thinking about creating man in my likeness and image, so I've got somebody to connect with and have a relationship with. What do y'all think? I bet all the angels would have been like, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, good idea. And I think I would give them an opportunity to turn and curse me in my face and, and do things bad. They would probably be like, no! You remember Satan, right? He was an angel. And he made a dumb choice and he fell and took a third of the angels with him. If you give them a choice, they will have a power to create unimaginable pain. God, if you let mankind have a choice, they might fly planes into buildings. They may have teenagers that go crazy. They might have, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. <clears throat> I said, no, I think I'm going to do it. Why? Why? Because He loves us. Say, so now how did you get, I mean, where are you going with all of that? Well, let me explain it to you. My wife's not in here today. She's down with keeping our kids, and that's why I've got to move on with this sermon, or it's going to be really rough at my house for the next few weeks. <laughs> Y'all didn't listen a little faster. Come on, pick it up. All right, here we go. She's smoking hot, though, if anybody's ever seen her. I'm just telling you. She is hot. For all you single guys who think there's no hope, if you could see her and you could see me, you'd know there's hope. <laughs> somebody with my features that landed somebody like that, I'm telling you, I am a negotiator. I am a convincer. And I, I ain't gonna lie, I'm scared to death she's going around me because she's so hot. And have you seen this? You understand? My features. I just, I got a pole. I just went home, got some carpenters. I hired my holder. Some guys came over and they put a pole in the kitchen and I got it bolted to the frame of the house and ceiling. And, and, uh, and every, uh, I just chained her up to that pole. <laughs> and I mean, I, 
I'm not a jerk. I give her a long enough change she can go to the bathroom and all. But I'm just saying. <laughs> Well, I mean, when I go to work in the morning, I just chain her up that pole because she's going around on me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> now I get home, I, you know, I, I massage her feet and cook her dinner, and we cuddle on the couch by the fireplace, and we go to bed, I get up next morning, I chain her up to the pole. <laughs> <laughs> right, how many of you believe this, first of all? If y'all do, I need to sell you something right now, you know? <laughs> sell you some land somewhere or something. Now, you know all this, is, 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 but let's just go with it, okay? Let's just say that I do that. And anybody knows my wife knows if anybody's getting changed to a pole, it's homeboy. It ain't her, you understand? <laughs> she will beat me with them chains, you know what I mean? It's just, it ain't going to happen. But let's just go with this for the sake of argument, for the sake of having fun right here. And let's say I could chain her up to that pole. And let's just say that, that, that we were to get married, and we've been married for 10 years, and for 10 years I've been chaining her to this pole. Now, how many of you think after 10 years would I, would, would I trust her more or trust her less after 10 years? Why? Because trust is earned. She never had an opportunity to be proven otherwise. You see, where there is no choice, there is no love. And if a person don't have choice, you can catch her and lock her in a closet if you want to. But please don't be misunderstanding. That is not love. That's manipulation. And it's against the law. <laughs> Some of you read to write that down. Just get it right there, write that down, right there. Here's what I'm going with this. Everybody that God ever made, because He loves us and He's always wanted a relationship, had a choice. Adam and Eve were born in relationship with God, but their choice was to break it. But you and I are born out of relationship with God, and our choice is to connect. But everybody gets a choice. Nobody is without choice. And you say, well, Dale, why would he make the choice? Because the potential joy that comes from the relationship. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have kids or want kids one day? Raise your hand, good and high. Then here's the deal. Don't you know, how many of you know that kids can, kids can, can get killed at an early age? They can run out in front of a car. Kids can become teenagers and act like you. And I mean, they're saying, how many of you know that kids can bring a lot of pain to your life? Raise your hand, good and high. And you still want kids. You know why you want kids? Because watch me, watch me. The potential joy that comes from your relationship outweighs the potential for sorrow. Amen. And when Jesus, when God was weighing whether or not to make us and give us a choice, He decided the potential joy that could come when we come together and sing, Your love never fails, it never gives up, and we stand with you. The potential joy that would come from you giving everything you've got and loving Him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength outweighed the potential sorrow that could come. You need to understand the nature of love. The second thing you need to understand if you're going to have a relationship with God is the nature of sin. You need to understand the sin of man. The sin of man. Romans 3.10 says, as the scriptures say, there is no one except Pastor Dale who always does what is right. Not even one. Is that what it says? And that's the substandard perversion that I just read from. Ready? Here's what it says. As the scriptures say, read it out loud. One, two, three. There is no one who always does what is right, not even one. Romans 3, 23. For who? Everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. You know what sin is? We all sin. You say, I think I'm pretty good. No, you sin. I'm telling you. Sin is any time you put self and self-will above God and God's will. Name a sin for me. Somebody, what's a sin? What's a sin? Somebody, lying. What a, when somebody lies, who do they think they're benefiting? Name another sin for me. Stealing. Whenever somebody steals, who do they think they're benefiting? Name another sin for me. One more. Yeah, y'all ain't that holy. Come on. Let's, come on. I know y'all know someone. What, somebody over here said, what now? Murder. When somebody murders, who do they think they're benefiting? At the core of every sin... Every time you're rude, every time you tell a lie, every time you're jealous, every time you steal, every time you commit adultery, is you somehow think that's going to benefit you. Sin is putting self and self-will above God and God's will. And because Adam and Eve sinned, because they allowed their selfishness to break the relationship they had with God, you and I are born into this world with this self-centered desire that left unchecked will ruin your life. Let me explain it to you. Let me ask you again. How many of you have kids? Raise your hand. Good and high. How many of you had to teach your kids to say, yes ma'am, no ma'am, thank you, please? How many of you had to teach them how to throw temper tantrums, lay on the floor, kick, scream, not share, act like their daddy? Anybody had to teach them how to act like their daddy? <laughs> Nobody. Why? They come out their mama acting like their daddy, somehow or another. <laughs> how many of you, your kids laid in bed at night and said, you know what? 
I'm hungry, and my diaper's wet, but mama needs her sleep. <laughs> I'm just laying here, right? Your kids didn't do that. Your kids said, get out of bed and get here now. Because I could care less about you. It's me. Your kid said, you take my toy and I'm going to snatch it back because that's my toy, right? In fact, when I go to your house, I'm going to throw a temper tantrum if I can't take your toys home with me. Because here's me and the rest of the world, right? And you see it from the day they come home from the hospital. And sometimes you see it when they're 35 years old. Can I get a witness, right? Because we're all born selfish. Anybody here ever done anything selfish? You better raise your hand. I'm going to switch this sermon to line, right? You like that? The sin nature says, given the opportunity, I will think of me before I think of you. Next thing you understand, have a relationship with God is a penalty for sin. Because of that selfishness, there's a penalty. There's a price tag to it. Romans 6, 23 says, for the what? The wages. Say that out loud. The wages. You see, now we understand wages, right? What, I, what's the minimum wage? $7 and something an hour? Right? What is it? Huh? Seven twenty-five. Is that what you said? Seven twenty-five. Seven twenty-five an hour. It means I give you one hour of my life, and you'll give me seven dollars twenty-five cents back. Makes you feel cheap when you said that way, right? <laughs> the wages of sin. What you get when you sin is what? Death. But now he switches language. But the what? What's the next? Not wages, but what? Free gift. Free gift. Now we're not talking about earning. Now we're talking about something that's. Now we're talking about Christmas. Somebody who got you a present, you didn't get them nothing. Free gift. Free gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages of sin is what? The wages of your selfishness, the wages of your self-centeredness, what you're going to get back from the self-centered nature and way you're living is what? Because somebody has to die. There's a penalty for sin. Now let's just say hypothetically that you're a kind of person who likes to drive a little faster than the speed limit, okay? I used to be that way before I had kids and I slowed way down, but let's just say hypothetically you're that kind of person, you get a little heavy in the foot, and let's just say that you, you know, I drive a Dodge Ram, and let's just say I'm driving down Horner Boulevard, and, 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 and all of a sudden, and I haven't learned this, whenever you're going really over the speed limit, they get a little more excited than when you're going just a little bit over the speed limit, okay? And let's just say that all of a sudden the, the, the police officer pulls you over and he comes up there and he's and he's got a dryer, he's got a flashlight like this, and he said, Juh, juh, juh. And what that means is driver license and registration, please. And they hold their flashlight like this because if you don't go for that very slowly, the driver's license and registration, they hold the light like this and they pop you in the head. <laughs> just take it from me. Now, uh, here you go. <laughs> He, he just and so he just says he says Drew, 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 Drew. and so you drive across the registration and you hand it to him and he looks at it and he says Mr. Sauls you know why I pulled you over? Because I'm good looking. <laughs> no, because you're going 65 and a 35. <laughs> That's dangerous. <laughs> I had no clue. I appreciate you letting me know because I didn't know. I mean, I was just cruising along and this is a Hemi, baby. And this is thing gets away from you sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Woo! Thank you, officer. I'll slow this baby down. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> just give me back my driver's off straight direction. We'll, we'll be on our way with slow I'm sorry, sir. We'll penalty for going 65 and 35 not being ignorant. Penalty for going 65 and 35 you can lose your license, pay a fine. Lose my license, pay a fine. Now see, all preachers, I don't use it very much, but all preachers learn in college how to have a preacher voice, you know what I'm saying? Where they can say, I mean, they, they learn how to read ingredients on the back of a cereal when people get saved. Potassium. <laughs> Carbohydrates. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, you know, you get this thing, and the people just volunteer for missions. Oh, you know, right there, you know. So I don't use mine very much, but we learn how to say, God. And it's like four syllables, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we just learn how to do that. So that's where you turn it on at, though. He's looking at your license and you say, Brother, can I see your tag? Brother officer. I know my license doesn't indicate it, but I'm a man of God. Man of the cloth. That's pastor. Back this, I will 
Forget this incident. Please come to open house Sunday. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. The penalty for going 65 and 35 is not having a good reputation. You will lose your license and pay a fine. I don't think you know who I am. One of my best friends is Michael Douglas Holder. <laughs> The son, the grandson of Sheriff Holder. I will tell him. I got it in my phone, you understand? And he, somebody's going to be rolling over this thing. I'm sorry, sir. A penalty for a 65 and a 35 is not knowing somebody who's got a good reputation in this community. You can lose your license. They find I tell you what I'll do. So here's what I'll do. I will get out of the truck. And I would pick up trash on both sides of the road for one mile that way and one mile that way if you won't give me this license, and make, give me this ticket, make me pay this fine and lose my license. I'm sorry, sir, the penalty for 65 and 35 is not good work. The penalty for 65 and 35 is you're going to lose your license pay fine. Y'all see where I'm going with this? You see, the penalty for sin is not being ignorant. Oh, I didn't know that was a sin. <laughs> The penalty for sin is not, well, I'm a good old boy. I mean, I ain't Mother Teresa, but I ain't Charles Manson. I'm right here in the middle. You know what I'm saying? I'm just as good as they are. Look at here. They come every Sunday, and I'm doing just as good as they are. They ain't no better than me. The penalty for sin is not, well, my grandma was a Christian, and because she's a Christian, I'm a Christian. Listen, listen. God don't have any grandkids. He only has kids. But now, you don't understand. I was born in a Christian home. I know kids born in a bread box, but they ain't bread. <laughs> You understand? Well, you don't know that I worked in the nursery for 20 years. Well, that's got to be something in heaven for you, I'm sure. But the penalty for sin is not, not good works. The penalty for sin is somebody's got to die. You say, well, I'm in the church every Sunday. Hey, I've been to McDonald's, but I'm not a big man. I park my car in the garage, but it's not a garage, it's a car. Just because you come to church every Sunday don't make you a Christian. You understand? Penalty for sin, somebody's got to die. And that's the reason this verse means so much. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, I mean that you've been saved by grace through believing. You did not save yourself. It was a gift from God. It was not the result of your own effort. So you can't brag about it. You know why? Because you didn't die. You know, for people to come, I get aggravated. They say, yeah, I used to be. And it's almost like they're bragging about who they used to be. You know, I used to be a bad person. I slept with a lot of women. I've done a lot of drugs. I've done a lot of bad things. One time I went down. And they start telling these stories. And it's like, you get this impression. They're kind of proud of who they used to be. And then they say, I turned my life around. I came to church and I, I saved myself. I got myself right. Now, I don't punch them in the throat, but I want to. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because it's like somebody drowning out in the ocean, and the lifeguard swims out to them, and they're screaming like a girl, and they pull them back up on the ocean, and they're unconscious, and they pump water out of their lungs, and then all of a sudden they come up, and everybody starts clapping, and that idiot who was sitting down there on the beach for just a minute ago, unconscious with his tongue hung out, stands up and says, thank you, thank you, thank you, I held on to the lifeguard all the way to shore. How ridiculous. They are not clapping for you, dude. They're clapping for the lifeguard. You understand? You couldn't save yourself if you had to. If you saved yourself, you wouldn't be here. You'd be dead. You can't say you turned your life around. You didn't. The hero every Sunday morning is Jesus Christ. He's the only answer. That's who we're clapping for, not singers and not preachers. And nobody else, those superstars. It's Him. If I saved anybody, I'd be dead. I ain't saved nobody. Not even me. Everybody understand? Yeah. So you need to understand the love of God. You cannot have any love without a choice. Second thing you need to understand is your selfishness, your sin, keeps you from making the right choice every time. You sabotage your relationship with God every day because of your selfishness. And because of your selfishness, there's a penalty. The penalty is death. And you're going to die for your selfishness. In fact, for a lot of you, your selfishness has almost killed you already. The fourth thing you need to understand 
if you're going to ever have a relationship with God, is the death of Jesus. And this is the greatest news. And from here on out, if I could possibly, I'm not trying to get on anybody or anything, but we're going to wind it down in just a second. If we can please have as much, uh, and if you need to slip out, slip out, but as much little movement as possible. Because I believe right now God's about to do something big for somebody. So if you need to slip out, do it. But if not, let's just hang with me. This is, this is the most powerful story ever told. 2 Corinthians 5.15 And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for him who died for them and was raised again. 2 Corinthians 5.21 for God made Christ who never sinned. See, He didn't have to die. To be the what? Offering for our sin. I don't like that. So that we could be made right with God through Christ. And this is a hard concept. I ain't going to lie about it. It's a hard concept. I, I, at one point in my life, I, I can't do it now, but at one point in my life, I knew Greek and I knew the Greek alphabet. I could translate parts of the Bible to English and all this. And I've been, uh, I was introduced to speak one time by my cousin, and my cousin introduced me to speak. He said, I'm going to introduce to you now a man who is educated way beyond his intelligence. <laughs> it's not really a compliment, but that's the truth, all right? But I'm going to tell you something. I've never understood this with all the education. Except for what my daddy told me when I was eight years old, it changed my life, and I'm convinced. I stand here right now today because of when I was eight years old, about that age, my dad told me this story, and, it, and I've never been the same. I said, Daddy, how can Jesus' death count for me? And here's what he told me. Imagine you've committed the worst sick crime in the world, and you're in court for it. And you're sitting there, and your, your uh, lawyers have made their case. And the defense attorney, I mean, the prosecuting attorneys have made their case. And you're waiting for the jury to deliberate and come back with your verdict. And the jury has reached a unanimous verdict. And so now they're coming in, and they say, All rise, Judge so and so is now in his taking the stand. And he comes back, and he sits down, and then everybody sits down. And you look over, and your granddaddy is sitting there. And you disgrace the whole family name. The shame on his face at that moment. Your mom's crying. And the judge says, Madam or Chairman, four person of the jury, have you reached a unanimous verdict? And they say, We have. And he says, Oh, say ye. And they say, In the matter of the state versus Dale M. Sauls, we find him guilty as charged and sentence him to the death chamber. And immediately there's this all over the room and the hush and, and you look at and your mom just wails out and she just wails out trying to have to escort her out and that just to hear her shrill the pain of what's about to happen as she loses her baby boy and as she watches what's about to happen and then you think maybe that judge maybe that judge there's something different about that judge maybe he'll find something maybe he'll overturn this maybe he won't go this way the judge says <laughs> verdict stands Defendant is sentenced to the death chamber just as the jury says, thank you for your service to the jury. And you look over and now your dad is crying. In those days, I've never really saw my dad ever cry. And a courtroom just erupts. Anytime there's a death penalty case, the courtroom just erupts. All the press is there. And everybody's just going crazy trying to grab an interview. And everybody's starting to move towards you. And you're, you're just, it's just washing over. I'm going to die. And all of a sudden, everybody's going crazy. The judge says, order, order, order my courtroom. Everybody be quiet. Everybody sit down. If you need to leave, leave. This court is now adjourned. But I want you to keep the, the, uh, the, the defendant there. I want to make some comments about this case off the record. If you need to leave, leave. I'll start talking in two minutes. Well, of course, nobody's going to leave. And the judge sits behind this big desk and he says, Devil, you know you're guilty. I know you're guilty. This jury knows you're guilty. Everybody else knows you're guilty. But I don't know what it is about you, but something about you, I just like you. When I was in my chamber, I was trying to find a way to get you out of this. 
Because I don't think you really do. I think you're good people <coughs> in your heart. You just made a bad choice. <coughs> but I can't. He stands up and he unzips his robe. He steps out and he lays the robe over his stand. Because whenever I took this stand, I made a vow that I would uphold the laws of this land. And for me to let you go would be a lack of integrity on my part. I can't do that. i got a good name. I've been an honest person. And I can't, I can't do that. I have integrity. But as a person, I can do anything I want to do. As a judge, I can. But as a person, I can't. So now... From now on, here's the deal. Before you take him out, let him go and arrest me. From now on, Dave, you're going to be the judge and I'm going to be you. Because Larry, I don't know why, but for some reason you matter to me. But there's just something about you, Dee, that I just care about you. And I don't want you to have... I think you're better than this. Now, I'm going to take your place. And from now on, I'm going to be Dee McGee. And you're going to be the judge. And from now on, Jr. every morning when you get up, don't say, how does Jr. want to live his life? No, 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 no. Jr. dies with me in that electric chair. How did that judge... How would he handle his marriage? Sean, how would this judge handle his finances? How would this judge, Brian, handle his co-workers? How would this judge do that? Because you're dying. Your name, your sins, you, you're dying with me. I am now you. And you get to be me. That's what it means for Jesus to become sin and die on the cross that you belong on. Does that mean you become little Jesus? No, but when you wear the name Christian, it means you're little Christ. When you become a part of the body of Christ, it means the closest anybody's going to ever get to Jesus Christ on earth is us. And you say, I will live his life on earth. I remember telling this to a man. He said, I ain't letting that happen. If I did the crime, I ain't letting that judge die for me. I'll do the time. And I looked at him with tears in my eyes and I said, Granddaddy, it's too late. He's already died for you. The issue is not whether or not he'll die. The issue is when two people die for the same crime. The issue is that his death did it happen in vain. He's already made the choice. But then what if I make a mistake? And he says, you know what? Hey, you're not going to think like I think all the time. You're going to, because you got, you're too selfish. I'm going to give you a whole book of instructions on how I think about money, how I think about family, how I think about marriage. Here's your book, wives. Here's your book, husbands. Here's your wife. Your book, parents. Here's your book, workers. Here's your book. You take this book and you do what it says. What if I make a mistake? What do you mean if? <coughs> you're going to make mistakes. I mean, if all your life the cold's been on the right, and all of a sudden we reversed it, how long is it going to take you to stop reaching with your right hand? If all your life the gas pedal's on the right and your brakes on the left, how long have we swapped that? How long are you going to keep? I mean, how long would it take to get that? You've been living a certain way. You're going to mess up. But you know what? I remember whenever I was uh, a kid. I remember whenever I was learning to walk. Anyway, I remember whenever I was learning to walk, and I remember, I remember standing up, and I remember, I remember standing up, and my daddy was over there, and he said, "Come here, son." To me, and I stood up, and, and I was wobbling, and I took a step, and I fell. And he said, "That's okay, he picked me up," and he stood me up, and he said, "Come here, son, come here." And I took a step, and I took two steps, and then I fell, and then I stood up, and then he picked me up, and I didn't take, I didn't take any steps, and I fell, and I stood me up, and I took two steps backwards, and I fell. And I remember my dad walking over and grabbing me by the shoulders and started shaking me, and he said, "What are you doing, falling?" Boy, you're a soul. You don't fall. Souls is a fall. Stand up and walk like a man. How many of you believe that? I should have had you when I told you I remember when I was learning to walk. 
Why do you think God does that to you? Why do you think every time you mess up, He knocks you out of heaven? If I'm walking from here to the hospital, when I get up here to Carthage Street and I fall down, does that mean I've got to come all the way back here and start over? It means I get up, brush myself off, hope nobody saw me right, and keep on walking. <laughs> Your Heavenly Father does the same for you. He knows you're not going to always get it right. But the goal of your life is to let you. That's what baptism means is the old you dies and you come up a new creature in Christ. And from now on, I'm going to live my life different because He paid for me. How do you understand? Let's finish this, baby. Here's what the Bible says. There's a way to God. How do you let His death count for you? Revelation 3.20 says, Look! King James says, Behold! That's an emphatic word. Hold your ears. It means, Hey! <laughs> Literally. Look! Hey! I've been standing. I'm standing out here at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice, now imagine this. This is God at, at a door knocking. He's the God of all the creation. He's the God that created the heavens and the earth. He could kick the door down if He wanted to. But He's not. Why? Because it's the, it, it, to do so would be like chaining a wife to a pole. He, don't want, he wants you to get up open the door. You have an act in this. Look, I've been standing at the door and I've been knocking and if anybody hears my voice and gets the courage and will get up and open the door, I will come in, I will point out everything they've ever done wrong, I'm going to take all their money and they're never going to have fun again as long as they live. Is that what it says? I will come in and what? Because that's all I've ever wanted is a relationship with you. That's what this thing's been about since Adam and Eve. That's what it's about today. I chose you. Will you choose me? That's all it's about. And as abstract as that is, behold, I stand at the door knock. I got this feeling you know what it's like if you're knocking, don't you? You ever lay in bed at night? <coughs> Felt like somebody's there with you? You be real quiet. You might hear not. You ever been outside and saw the sun set and just feel like God's arms wrapped right around you like a warm blanket of a coat pad? You ever watch birds or squirrels or been deer hunting and watch nature and think, man, this could have been an accident? Be real quiet. You ever hear it? You ever go through an almost near death experience and come out the other side and just felt God's hands? If you're being real quiet in that moment, <coughs> maybe right now, in a service like this, in a moment like this, you be real quiet. How do you open the door? Here's what the Bible says. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Let me tell you what that means. It don't mean that just that you believe He died and He was a person in history. It means that He's in charge of the world. He's in charge of the... You say, we don't use words like Lord very much anymore. But you understand it, right? You saw Lord of the Rings. You've seen those things, right? You know, they got a kingdom. They're Lord. They're King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God Most High, Chairman of the Board, CEO, the driver of the car, not the co-pilot, the pilot. Jesus is Lord. He's in charge. And believe in. It don't say believe about. Believe in. See, there's a difference in believing about. I believe about Hitler, but I am not a Nazi. I believe about communism, but I'm not a communist. As a matter of fact, let me tell you, I believe about. You say, well, I believe Jesus Christ died and rose again. That's great. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the demons believe that. See, I believe about Satan, but I am not a Satanist. 
Believe in. It means to put your faith in. It means, you see, I can believe this chair can hold me up, but my faith's not in that chair yet until I walk over and sit down. Now my faith is in this chair. Believe in your heart. It's a heart thing. It's not about praying prayers. Nobody has ever been saved by praying prayers. I don't know how we got that in America. It's like we repeat after somebody and it's like we're doing a lock. Three turns to the right, four turns to the left, and then the lock falls open. No! Salvation is a heart thing. You can say whatever you want to with your mouth, but if you don't have it in your heart, this is about a relationship. That's all it's ever been about is a relationship. Eternal life is about a relationship. Believe in your heart. That God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart, again, it's your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So you say it out loud to let people know that I'm staking my whole eternal destiny in the fact that that judge died for me. So that's the gospel, friend. You put your faith in that. You say, I don't trust very easy. You trust God. You, we're the most gullible people in the world. Come on, don't tell me you don't trust easy. You drive across bridges, you don't get out and look under the bridge and make sure it's all right. You just drive your car across that bridge. You brush your teeth every morning using the water. And you, don't, you don't go get the water tested. You just assume it's going to be all right. Don't you let that little excuse block you. Here it is. God loves you. He wants you to love Him back. But your selfishness will keep you away if you're not careful. But if you keep letting that selfishness dictate your life, the penalty will be death and separation <laughs> from God. But Jesus has already paid for you. So today you can connect with Him. Understand how you understand. Don't you close your eyes. Again, it's not about praying a prayer, but would you say these words? If you're not sure you're connected to Christ, maybe you come to church every Sunday, but you're not sure until right now how you believe in all this kind of stuff. You ain't, you, ain't, you ain't ever got all this together, but the day you've decided to follow Jesus, would you say these words? God, I'm sorry. Say it out loud. Say, God, I'm sorry for living the way I've been living. Today I choose you. Now, if you're praying that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. You're just as much a Christian as I am. Today, God's becoming more than a word for you. To now, you realize it's about a relationship with God. Life is about sharing a meal with God, doing life with God. Heads bowed, eyes closed, but I'm going to read this last verse to you. The Bible says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. You know, yesterday... Every time somebody scored a touchdown, the crowd roared. The Bible says right now, if you just prayed that prayer, you now have eternal life. And heaven is rejoicing. There is a party going on in heaven. The angels are shouting. And yesterday's football games, all of them combined, can't compete with the noise right now in heaven. If you just prayed that prayer in a minute, the kingdom of God. And I'm going to do something right now, and I never do this, and you don't have to do what I'm about to say. What I'm going to do right now, I don't know if I've ever done it before, but I just feel compelled to do it today. I want you to get an idea of what God feels like whenever you make a commitment to Jesus Christ. He's been waiting all your life for this moment right now. And you don't have to do what I'm about to say to have eternal life. You don't have to do what I'm about to say to be a Christian. But if you just feel like you just made that commitment, you just threw your, you just threw, you just made your decision, you're going to follow Christ, you chose God, and you want everybody to know it, would you stand up right now? That's you. If you made your decision today, you may have been far from God, but you decided, I'm choosing God. That church family, let them hear what heaven sounds like. Thank you. 